This is Total Warhead, and welcome to an analysis of the Kugath faction in Immortal Empires here at the launch of Immortal Empires patch 2.0.0. I want to delve deep into like the positives at the moment, which are way less in quantity than the negatives, and really talk about how to improve this faction to make it as fun from early to late game as possible. Let's begin. So the number one thing to talk about here is that like the majority of factions that we start out with like at, in the beginning that we can potentially go to war against are weakened miss missile capabilities we got lizardman we got gorst and then skaven necessarily in early game not too scary and in that terms in those terms and then also there's ogres to the north that are also nothing like to be afraid of given that we are the blob kings uh per se or one of the best blobbing faction in the campaign the only one that's really a, a big worry is imbric on the left side of the map now that's important to take into account so you have good capabilities of expanding early on towards north and then west and also deal with imric when you have built up your army's capabilities to better be able to reach those missile units and their gate their power against you number two we start out with a lot of resources early on like regions that have resources that we can get there's a place with timber we start at Dragonfang Mount that has spices. There's also uh, another region up here that has uh, spices up here to the north. So you have the capabilities of getting a lot of resources early on, which in turn lets us get more infections passively. If we actually build this region, it's building here, I haven't done it yet. So you can get infections and hero capacity increases, which is great. Some things that you really always want to aim to get when you're playing these faction, this faction. Additionally, we also get a lot of ports to start out, including a unique one that gets a whopping 800 income at tier 3, albeit at a big cost, but this makes a lot of money, and this one gives extra control and growth, meaning that we don't have to spend a building slot on control and growth in this region. We can dedicate it to basically a resource, um, the resource building uh, for the medicine in this location, so we have a good chances to make a lot of money early on so right to start out grabbing these three islands at the very beginning of the campaign now additional things that are good in terms of kugath at the moment is that with immortal empires and the wars of chaos rework now the cultists that we can get as kugath can get a war shrine giving us a whopping extra 8k in overall health but also giving us also an aoe for heals a unique one which helps us Get, make our blobbing in our faction even stronger in this uh in this uh campaign and in turn with him getting that healing on a chaos war shrine or you or you just using a chaos war shrine as it is means that kugath with his a crazy 20k hp that he can get means that he has a passive constant heal in his campaign meaning that you don't necessarily have to uh, give him like a vile seed for regeneration you can give him a ward save item so it's further improving the blobbing just from a single guy getting a mount you know which is great for this faction additionally another really valuable thing is that our reforms that will rework in case you stop playing after patch 1.1 you know they actually are giving a lot of good statistical bo bo boost ward saves recruit rank ammunition 100 percent extra ammunition for exalted plague bearers and soul grinders all these bonuses are really great and it's good that these things have been reworked for this faction now, another thing that's important is the Aura Wars. The Aura Wars are a good addition because some of them, like for example, the Festering Stooges, this guy has extra, has now have passive heals, which is great. And additionally, he has a great extra bonus here with extra melee defense for a unit that has great melee defense as is. And if he, you keep getting these reforms that give more work save, more statistical boost for Exalted Plague Bears, they can become even stronger. The Demon Spew helps bolster our actual blobbing capabilities with the Swarm of Flies, giving us a minus 5 melee attack and a 35 meter AoE, further reducing the chances that the enemy is able to hit us. The Dunder, the Bilious Dunder Guff Chaos Giant also helps us in terms of our magic. Now, the thing about Kugat is that his strength is that it's blobbing, heals, and big time magic, kind of like vampire counts. With the Chaos Giant, our war, you get a ability that lowers armor around him to mul uh, multiple units by minus 30, which combines really well with utilizing Black Boil. So you basically fart first, then you pop a pimple, and then you destroy a lot of units. Really good addition to the campaign. And also, given that a weakness that you can have as Kugath is potential flanking units with a lot of charge bonus potentially hitting you up. The Pox Riders of Nurgle are a good unit with good overall mass that get a unique ability that actually helps him 
we lower the mass of whatever they're engaging by minus 25% in a 35 meter range, which is really good. Now, additionally, if you're in a blob and you put this guy in there, it's an effect range. So whatever it's being engaged could potentially get stuck if you flank it with other units. And therefore, the whatever is basically surrounding your blob can then get surrounded in kind of like a donut kind of like scenario. So anyways, really good additions to the campaign here. Additionally, with the Warriors of Chaos rework, we see that now we are able to recruit some of the units of the Chaos Marauders, like Mar Marauders of Nurgle. You can also get Chaos Warriors. You can get Chaos Warriors of Nurgle great weapons on the uh, Soul Grinder based building slot. So, you, and then also if you look here, we can get Marauder Horsemen of Nurgle as well, helping us further boost our capabilities to flank and to skirmish the enemy, which really didn't really have that much skirmishing capabilities except Plague Drones heads, which are really expensive and more for like against single entities or low unit count, high HP units. So we are getting now a boost to help us better in terms of flanking. We now can get Chaos Knights of Nurgle. We have half capabilities with more speed than what we traditionally get with like the Pox Riders. And then we can get Chosen of Nurgle from this tree line and then Chosen of Nurgle with great weapons as well. And then we can also get a Chaos War Shrine now, which is great. So all of this is telling us that now we have more units that we can potentially get in the campaign to help bolster some of our weaknesses, have more skirmishing, at least some skirmishing power, have more cav units that are elite, you know, heavy uh, charge bonus units with more speed than what we typically use, and then really strong infantry. So we don't just depend on, for example, the exalted plague bearers that don't necessarily have too much, a um, what do you call it, AP damage, while the Chosen of Nurgle do. So we get these boosts now to also complement whatever units we're getting before. So it's not, it's not like we have to build additional buildings. Now we have these capabilities to get additional units with what we already used to build. Additionally, I'm very happy that for the red skill lines, they have combined the new units with corresponding, I would say, correct uh, subsets of units to get the same buffs that you would want to get, you know, for one units and the others. For example, Armor of Melody gives the bonus to armor and melee defense to the Plague Bearers like it usually did but also to the new infantry units like the Marauders and the Chaos Warriors and the Chosen. So you get all these statistical boosts, you know, for infantry units in general in one red skill line. And then Putrid uh, Resistance groups up our elite units and it correctly adds the Chosen and the Chaos Warriors uh, with, for example, Beast of Nurgle, Great Unclean One, Soul Grinders. So this is automatically telling us like our main firepower, our main strength of our campaign these units are indicated right here in putrid resistance so they group them up correctly to put all that's really strong for you to have in your faction to stat boost it with a single red skill line node now time to talk about the negatives and <laughs> all right here we go so we start on these islands we now have temperate climate that's suitable so we have good with frozen wasteland chaotic wasteland temperate temperate island savanna for some reason and then jungle we have unpleasant with magical forest and mountain and then uninhabitable ocean and desert so what what's wrong with this with this like scenario here so we do start out with temperament and that's great here we get all these locations that are good for us but then look what happens as you expand out to decide where to move next you have a potential enemy in Gorst that's not really uh inhabitable i mean that's not really habitable it's unpleasant north you have ogres that can declare war on you this is not really habitable. You have these areas here that show you, oh, good, we can keep expanding northwards, but then not really hab habitable. Dwarfs that can be potential big enemies to us, not really habitable. Like, we want to fight dwarves. No, not really habitable in this direction. On this side, not really habitable as well. As so we move towards the west, and then as, as that show, desert, probably means that everything over here is not really going to be too habitable for us. So what the campaign is telling us is that the main push that we have is like, a straight beeline path all the way north to get into really good favorable climates all the way up here in the like chaotic waste areas if you want to push on a straight beeline path or you push straight to Cathay like it basically shows you like a limitation in scope in terms of like where you can expand really early on in the campaign because even this second commandery that you push to has a unpleasant location to push into Gorst, unpleasant and then Imric, who was also a potential big enemy early on two of his regions are unpleasant as it is so what the game is telling you is like automatically uh careful you're gonna struggle with getting a lot of money early on and i'm gonna throw you unpleasant climate locations 
for you to have to struggle building up your starting commanderies. That to me doesn't make that much sense for it to be designed in such a kind of like a border gore kind of scenario. Okay, so talking about climates, now let's move on to reforms. One of the best initial reforms that you can get when playing in the realms of chaos campaign is viral incubation that gives you plus 10 growth in chaotic wasteland climates and a great minus 25% recruitment cost in chaotic wasteland climates. That's great. But chaotic wastelands are really far up in the north, all the way up here, like nowhere close to where you start out with. So then if you look here and you look at the reforms, you got to go all the way up to the one I'm researching now. It's like turn 45 to get growth in temperate climate and minus 25% recruitment costs in regions with temperate climates. That means that you must have already moved to such an area where you're now in savanna climates potentially pushing. Or if you look over here to wherever else you can potentially push, it becomes wastelands all the way up here if you were to push in this direction, not chaotic wastelands. So you're talking about a reform that's still designed around the realms of chaos campaign and not necessarily designed for the immortal empire system we gotta find like a happy medium here so this low tier reform gets reworked so it's both temperament climate and you know chaotic, chaotic wasteland so if you're playing either of the two campaigns you can therefore get both of the benefits all right we start out in a three island or region commandery now that's great income Let's just leave it at that in terms of the good, great income phenomenal, the negative, the whole system to how Kugath works, how Kugath gets great bonuses in a micro level by plagues is that you need to spread plagues in adjacent regions. If you put a plague in either any of these three starting regions, they don't have adjacent locations, so they don't necessarily spread as is between them, so you lose out on early on plague spread like in the first five turns of the campaign until you push north towards this area and then you can start doing plague spread across settlements that in turn hampers your early game potential um growth slash control based uh system in, and also getting um favor from spreading plagues because you can't really spread plagues across these areas only in the shattered stone bay can you get it the only region that's not part or that's not an island based location and from there, you can now actually start taking advantage of the plague spreading. But it's after you've already acquired your entire first commandery, delaying one of the big things or the fun things to playing Kugath, which is spreading plagues and having fun, just the fun of popping plagues. Now, how a solution to this that would be potentially good, which is not going to happen, is but if the islands could actually be considered adjacent to each other, if they had like actual land bridges and borders so they could actually connect that could in turn cause plague spread to work across these locations but also if you want to push it even further if these three regions were actually ports around this like area of the map which is too small then that would work now very close to like the whole climate uh thing like early on is you're starting potential enemies now this campaign is basically like surrounded by potential enemies early on the reason for that is because you start out with negative 100 relations with force all right at the beginning of the campaign and addition negative 100 with imric and then everybody that's up here that you see is negative 40 relations but then here's the catch that really pissed me off like crazy once you basically start engaging gorst and defeating him these freaking uh ogres get pissed off with you if you do any negative things to gorst so they, you get diplomatic penalties little by little by little against the ogres and then all of a sudden they're like oh you know what um let's actually not actually be good friends with you um and start declaring war on you so and that's people that are coming from unpleasant climates so you're getting potential enemies from unpleasant climates completely up here in the north and in turn i don't necessarily understand why the hell they'll be happy with course or you know get pissed off if you do anything against course so there's that in addition imric is all the way over here at negative 100 auto relations so I kind of wish that Imbric was at either negative 40 if the game is telling me to push towards this direction. So everybody around these areas are negative 40. The ogres do not get happier if uh, you do actions uh, or more pissed off if you do actions against Gorst. And then the game tells me through diplomatic penalties that pushing towards the east side of the map is the way to go. And if it was designed to push towards the dwarves, then I would flip the script, make Gorst like negative 40 or maybe a bit more positive than that, and then make Imric negative 100 to basically push in this direction this way. Another thing, your first big initial enemy is potentially Gorst. 
when you defeat Gorst as Kugath, or I don't know, any Nurgle faction down the line, he gives poison when you defeat him. Oh, okay, that is really useful. Like, there's really no reason to actually be playing with that, or like basically aim to defeat Gorst as you're gonna get a redundant defeat trait, which kind of is like, meh, whatever. So I wish something else was given, not necessarily poison. Um, but then again, that's they decided to put one faction next to each other. And because they, un they don't like each other, you're going to face him. You're going to have a very prolonged fight against them because it's blob versus blob to in turn get a crate that is not necessarily going to feel rewarding. Okay, another thing is that you see that we have this building built. It's a unique port building. It's already built. It's already at level one when you start the campaign. But when you start expanding, you see that this location has a generic strategic location. You would think, okay, that's cool. Perhaps I can get the chance to build the building. Uh, not really. So it appears that Kugath cannot build the generic strategic locations that are throughout the map because of his unique building structure, how it's designed. So maybe it's a bug. Maybe it's not. You tell me. In my opinion, I wish he could build these things. So one thing is that, the, for example, these new guys that we got, the Exalted Hero of Nurgle, he can get Hideous Visage that can get minus 8 control in local enemy province. And they can, this can stack if you have a plague ridden hero that has the negative 3 control in local province. And then the minus 4 or 3 that you can get in total from each of them. So you can get minus 6, um, minus 8, that's minus 14. You can get minus 17 public order in total, I believe, between two characters in a single region. Which in turn means you can do some farming of actually getting like uh, rebellions spawned in locations. So what I've noticed is that whenever a rebellion of Nurgle-based corruption spawns, it doesn't even win against the garrison that it's engaging, and it barely weakens it. Like, I had a Cathay base or Cathay holding this location here for a long time, and I would spawn rebellions to win against this location, but no, there was really no value out of it, which kind of was like a big waste. So I wish that whatever spawned, or the AI mentality when they spawned from a rebellion, they would try to build up their army that actually spawns little by little by little until they can potentially win um, against whatever they're spawning against. Kind of like what they do against the player. So that way, you in turn cause rebellions to become a effective way to engage or to win against the enemy. Another thing, this exalted hero that we get of Nurgle, it's great. He has a lot of things to make him a great combat a hero or bit or good like support based hero with good melee capabilities one negative though is that we get plague feeder here and it has a redundant effect when you play kugath the nurgle authority plus one if i'm not mistaken works more so for like warriors of chaos based factions so that's an effect that is not really doing anything for you now you still get plus five melee defense and that's great but you're giving something here that only works for partial factions that this hero belongs to. The next thing is that I don't understand why the exalted hero of Nurgle has locus of fecundity given to him. Now, when I think of an exalted hero of Nurgle, right, me imagining here, right, I want him to be all about firepower, 1v1s, or if I use him for support purposes, to help out my offensive capabilities. I think locus of fecundity should be something that the plague ridden like heroes get access to. And then also what he can get in turn is not the locus of fecundity, is the offensive ability. Let me see if I find it over here in this guy. I believe that he should get access to locus of virulence so he can get yet another AP damage weapon buff and extra melee attack for him. And if he has a clan of Pux Riders or Chaos Knights with him, he just stab boosts them even further to make him even more deadly under charge or under engagement. So he can be like a leader of the flank that's hitting up enemy, further helping bolster one of the weaknesses that you can have as you play Kugath. Another thing is that these new exalted heroes get absolutely disgusting traits. Now, I'm not sure if this is supposed to be by design, but when you compare their quality to what you can get from like the dedicated Nurgle based traits, they're just lower in magnitude and power. For example, with Exalted Heroes, you can get a trait that gives minus 8 control, right, in local province and fear to the hero. And then Infectious here gives minus 3 control in local enemy province. Dude, like, lo way lower magnitude and an additional attribute is not giving to the hero. So I wish that, like, the traits were basically worked in such a way where they have similar scope or similarities and implementation. So, sure, there might be less overall traits to select from, but 
you can have potentially the same quality of a trait like infectious here is actually replaced with the one that the exalted heroes get nowadays and therefore actually get some of these that actually improve for example this hero to become better at inflicting casualties or for example on holy strike that gives you additional uh 15 success chance to assassinate characters these things will be great for like trait ridden and cultist characters to become better for example for like doing agent based actions instead of being utilized mainly for battle based purposes because infectious here even the trait that you get as the exalted hero for lowering co control by minus eight is not necessarily useful now the thing about cult buildings right is that you can easily get a cult building early on from like nurgle based factions that are found throughout the map so that's great for example the tower of flies is held by a nurgle based faction early on here in the immortal empires campaign so you can easily get a cult built here but this is something that i miss from realms of chaos and i can't believe i just said that and it is that in realms of chaos you start next to a great unclean one led faction the faction that controls the tower of flies in this campaign is a herald based faction to start out so you lose the chance of confederating a great unclean one by turn 20 to 30 in your campaign so i really wish that for like slanesh and nurgle and all these other heroes the other generic based faction that is in immortal empires is not led by a herald but a by a uh, exalted based lord therefore if you can get a confederation by popping a cult building you can in turn get a great um basically exalted character leading an army that you can just basically recall or utilize him with that additional strength additionally i find that the cult based building structure for nurgle is stagnantly designed and kind of boring it's like oh let's get more infections per turn okay that's good but okay cool and this is con and this is conditional also you can get plus five from this one okay cool this one's based if a lord is present okay and then this one over here is a random plague is given to the settlement now I pop this one over here and in turn this means that you can get more potential plagues across different locations if the corruption there is high enough but I don't find that exciting like I don't find that enticing to have that building kind of like there as it is these two are kind of boring by design given that they have these conditions this one is plus five infections per turn okay cute that's nice you know but I haven't been able to spread the corruption enough Nurgle base around here because I really don't have the capabilities to do so. There's no adjacent Nurgle based corruption gain from any of these buildings. And then getting a random plague destroys the cult here, which in turn makes you hope that hopefully with the extra the plague being random here, you can get additional adjacent Nurgle corruption and hopefully get the probability of getting another cult built around these areas. I think this would be more exciting if the plague cult colony would let me put a recipe like this location could in turn have a plague cauldron based recipe that I could use and I could get a plague recipe like doesn't exist here one that gives a massive boost to like Nurgle corruption in the settlement and adjacently so what you can do is therefore get like a massive adjacent amount of like Nurgle based corruption and with that recipe hopefully it works if not you have to pop it again and waste 150 infections every time you do it but in turn, you can potentially on another part of the map, just keep getting cults and cults and cults and therefore build them, you know, deconstruct the building that helps you get the recipe there, deconstruct it and build one that gives like additional infections or addition, you know, like, or whatever you want to make those two buildings that are kind of boring. So in turn, you make this exciting to utilize. Okay, so this one like really gets me in, in like, uh, why is design like this? You can get a warpstone locust, right? The useful building. You know, so some people don't necessarily like a design like this. Um, that can help us get higher chance of a plague spreading with it, and with high enough Nurgle corruption, and with one of the symptoms, you can get a hundred percent plague spread. That's great for this building. But why am I getting Nurgle corruption from this? Like by the time you're even able to build this, you can get so much high Nurgle corruption by like turn twenty and onwards in the campaign that you don't necessarily care too much about getting Nurgle corruption from in another building other than like the ones that are already give plague or like Nurgle corruption like the main building like here and then also the ports give Nurgle corruption as well like I think that this building will be better off providing an not like a secondary kind of like buff maybe like additional units for your garrison could be useful and then that could in turn be like make it make it enticing for you to build this up 
end level to tier 3 or 4 because as it is right now, I would want to build this in locations that are surrounded by a lot of adjacent regions that I control to get 100% chance of a plague spread and make a lot of money. But past this uh, level 2, I don't see a reason to build this up any higher in Immortal Empires. So why don't you make this both a location for spreading plagues and getting great garrison units here or any additional uh, like parameter or like specialty you want to give this to make it enticing to build higher than a tier 2 location as right now this is a redundancy all right i want to talk about the weeping creepers building so the weeping creepers building can give you at the casualty replenishment in armies in region not in province in region additionally you get neural corruption in local location and adjacently going back to the same uh, problem here is that neural corruption you can get so much of it enough as is that this parameter becomes redundant I have neural corruption everywhere in the campaign map, like like to 100 by this point, almost. And I don't have a reason to have built this building at all so far in the campaign, as it takes four four turns to even get the casualty replenishment in this location to like 3%. And by that point, your army would already have moved or have replenished fully to move and do other things in the campaign map. So this building doesn't really have too much of a like purpose to build at this time. How I would restructure it is that the casualty replenishment has a very good value of like up to 12%. Why don't you make it province-wide? That's it. Boom. Done. No corruption effect? Remove it. Not really being effectful right now. If effectful? Effectful? Useful. Right now in the campaign. So I'd say that this is actually something that can be reworked in such a manner. And additionally, this goes into another problem that I see with playing Kugath in the campaign. So I want you to look at this building structure here, right? So... You're going to struggle with getting like high magnitudes of money really early on. And another thing you're going to struggle with is flanking capabilities to like grab capture points or like points in like settlement battles. Um, potentially flank the enemy to lower their melee evasion. In turn, it makes you have to play as a blob based faction early on. Albeit, it's not necessarily too much fun to play blobs where you have a lot of like high power or like good powerful abilities early on and it can cause very prolonged battles now that's not necessarily a bad thing because streams of corruption are awesome to use but when you play against gorst early on you can have battles that can last 20 to 30 minutes because you're just there waiting and waiting and waiting until basically the h people start to run out for one side or the other but if you get flanking capabilities you can greatly lower the melee defense to like null for the units that the enemy has and therefore actually capture the victory points to gain momentum and increase your own melee attack in like major siege battles. But the thing is that if you try to get Chaos Warhounds, you need to spend $5,000 in a good climate location, which is a lot of money. And if you want to get Chaos Furies, this is just insane. If you want to get basic Chaos Furies, you got to spend $10,000. Like this doesn't make sense to me. I think that Chaos Warhounds and Chaos Furies should be moved to this building of Weeping Creepers here to give it a sort of military and casualty replenishment sort of usage for you to actually be able to get these units here and get a lot of them. You already have four buildings here that provide Nurglings. Like, how many Nurglings do you need? Like, this is, this is enough, man. Like, you don't necessarily need... And this actually makes this kind of boring that these units are like this here. In fact, why don't we... <laughs> now I'm going to, like, roll back my suggestion of the previous point. Why don't we just eliminate the Weeping Creepers building entirely? You already have control... You have growth here. You can get Nurglings here as is. How about if at tier 3 here, when do you need a level 2 location here, you can get like Chaos Warhounds for this one or Chaos Furies on this one or at lower tiers if you want to, but still keep the Nurglings. That way, you have two buildings that do whatever you need to already. I have yet to have you find the use case for this casualty replenishment rate and this Nurgle Corruption. So this building as is, is redundant. And we can fix this problem of not having good flanking, uh, like weak units early on in Chaos Furies and Chaos Warhounds. So you can get them from these buildings that you will want to build in a lot of locations to stabilize your control. Now, something very important that it goes back to like the fundamentals of the design of how Kugath works. Something that I wish that this campaign or this faction had or Nurgle factions had is I wish that the freaking ability points like for Nurgle based abilities that Kugath can get were generated by inflicting damage in battle, not from taking damage, because it's a, it's kind of like a slow grind and not necessarily like a fully in your control unless you play dangerously kind of scenario. 
and depending on a lot of heals for you to generate those abilities. And in turn, early on in the campaign, you really can't really take advantage of the abilities um, that much because you really don't want to put some of your generals who are not necessarily too strong in danger. And in turn, it's not as fun as when you can use Nurgle based abilities by inflicting damage. So this is from a Danny. <laughs> this is crazy. I'm showing a clip showcasing that Danny is more fun as Nurgle than Kugath. That's Nurgle, like base faction. So this is a very late game Rose of Chaos uh, clip on my Twitch where I was utilizing a Nurgle Lord on a rough fly with Locus of Contagion, Blight Boil ability, Blight Boil um, also and Streams of Corruption. And I'm weakening a lot of the units that enemy has, but I want you to look at the right. Whenever I use Locus of Contagion and my magic abilities and abilities with this Lord and watch how this bar goes up and like back down when I use an ability and then goes back up really fast. Like, this is so enjoyable to listen to, to utilize. Like, it's so much fun. And then when you play, Nur like, Nurgle Kugath, you don't get access to this fun, man. I lost track of my magic use. Yeah, that should help. Holy shit, what? That little end right there. Did you see, look at those freaking bars going up, dude. Like, just, just listen to that. Listen to that. Boom. Like, that feels so good to do. And you can use it so many freaking times. Like, in a battle because of all these magic abilities. And let me, it's just way more fun to play late game Nurgle as uh, Danny than late game Nurgle as Kugat because of this essential difference. So the next thing I want to talk about is the bugs that are currently found in the campaign. Now, let me just, let me just take a step back. This is on the Danny campaign, but these ancillaries you should be able to acquire when you play Kugat. So these two ancillaries are Preacher of Decay, which has won a battle against a Nurgle army, which can be acquired if you farm Nurgle rebellions which is kind of detrimental at the moment. And you could get a really strong action-wide plus two recruit rank for Plague Bearers of Nurgle and Exalted Plague Bearers of Nurgle units. You can also get, if you win a battle against a Plague Bearer unit, again, potentially can do that if you farm Rebellions, to get minus 20% recruitment cost for Plague Bearers and Exalted Plague Bearers for Lord's Army. Now, great items. Now, I want you to look at this. Plus two recruit rank and minus 20% recruitment cost, right? Faction White and Lord's Army. Right now in the campaign, I can get the Plague Bearers at rank 6, and recruitment cost is 140. I'm going to unequip these two items. And if we look here, the unit rank is still 6 to recruit these units, and the recruitment cost is still 20%. Not. It doesn't actually decrease. So it's in, in turn, these two items are bugged at the moment. You don't necessarily gain them in a manner that they are, like, you're able to get them effectively because rebellions are not easy to essentially farm to get ancillaries if you want to do that but also once you get these ancillaries they're kind of at the moment not kind of they're not working at this time another interesting bug that i found and i'm not sure if it was that kugath was taking attrition if he was in force march if he was in the water or if it was a combination of any of the two or three that are mentioned that were mentioned before but if you look here, I got really confused because if you notice, Kugat has a minus 50% um, infection cost to infect his own army. But in this specific scenario, he actually has, does not have that actually applying to him. Watch. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, shit, what am I doing to myself? Wait, wait, wrong person. Wait, what? Why am I getting an infection cost of 50 right now? It should be 25. Uh, that doesn't make sense. Whoa. Ooh, buggy, buggy, buggy. Why are you fit? Hold on. Dude, is it because I'm in the water? What is going on? Anyways, so I'll stop it here. So yeah, you can see here at the bottom left, it says inspection cost minus 50%, but he was not getting it as he was in the water. So that is it for this video. You know, you're actually looking at myself, looking at myself in Premiere Pro. <laughs> Freaking weird, man. 
uh, I really want to thank you for your time. I know, I, you know, I like to make these long videos. I don't really like uh, that much fun to make short videos. So I really want to thank you for spending the time to watch this and leave, let me know in the comments what other kind of videos you want to see in the future. Right now, I'm having fun playing Warhammer 3. I didn't think I would say that because I already have burned out on Warhammer 2 as it was. So now I'm back to Warhammer 3 having some fun with Immortal Empires, but there are bugs abound and definitely Kugat faction could definitely be a lot more fun to utilize if certain quirks were worked out as mentioned in this video. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you on the next one. Bye bye.